Uh, thanks, y'all, for coming. I know you're all probably ready to eat dinner. You're probably been up since 8 o'clock, and you got the party at uh, 6.30, so we'll try to move this on and uh, not to waste too much time. Um, does anybody here use finagle already? No? Okay. Um, well, finagle is a fault-tolerant RPC uh, server. It's used by Twitter right now, and basically it's uh, protocol agnostic, so you can talk to various services. It can be uh, different protocols. We'll, we'll go through that in a minute. And the reason um, we decided to look into um, Finagle, we work for Bear Paint Company. I don't know if you've ever been to a Home Depot. They sell paint at Home Depot. We also sell other brands of paint, um, Kills Casual Colors, Kills Primers, uh, Hammerite Rest Cap, different brands in the U.S., Canada, China, Mexico, uh, Chile. I think we're moving into Brazil pretty soon. And uh, basically, uh, we work on the websites, the marketing websites, bear.com, uh, mastercameronkills.com, and uh, the uh, international sites. And on the, um, there's a bear, a professional site right now. We also have kiosk at the Home Depot uh, for matching paint colors and wood, wood stains. And also uh, a lot of um, iPhone apps and uh, Android apps where you can download them from the iPhone store for free. And... You can scan your wall and match your paint colors from home and order paint samples, do things like that. All of these um, various uh, devices, whether it be the kiosk, the um, phone apps, the web servers, they all talk to various back-end services. And this is really getting more complicated these days because nowadays whenever somebody submits a request, they want to generate a rich email. I'll show you an example of that. They want to update um, Salesforce, they want to possibly opt the user into our email list, they want to either submit the order to our ERP system or save a project on our bear.com website. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of things going on and we don't want the user to have to wait for all of these events to happen. And if an event fails, we don't want, the, you know, that's not the user's problem. What's he going to do about it anyway, right? He just wants to know that, you know, his order's been placed or his project's been saved or whatever. Um, as mentioned, the emails. Here's an example right here of a, an email we send from the kiosk. And our marketing doesn't want basic emails. We use uh, Java Advanced Imaging to paint this image here with the colors that the user selected at the, uh, at the store. And that, you know, that takes time. Um, If you go down here, we have to get the store information here. We have to call the color service to render this. This has one color, but they can have multiple colors painted on this image. We have to go get the current promotion. There's advertisements and stuff in this email. We have to get all this information just to send the email out. Also, they can request to opt the person into the email list. We have to save the data to the database, and you know all that can take some time. And they want a kind of instant uh, response. They don't want to sit there and wait for this to happen. The same way. When people go into the e-commerce sites and place orders, we, we have to update Salesforce and uh, their order in uh, SAP ERP systems and, um, you know, update our databases, update various systems. So we decided to look at uh, Twitter's finagle, maybe to handle these events asynchronously, handle failovers and load balancing and things like that for us. So we're going to do a brief overview, and then we'll go through an example of some real code. It, it doesn't do much, but it generates all the principles of uh, Finagle. As I said, we're, we work for Bear Paint. I'm Mike Pallas, and this is Brian Cole. I've talked a little bit about Bear Paint. Okay. There's a, uh, been a history going back to about the 90s, I guess, when people started doing websites. And first they tried Corba to talk to various uh, remote distributed servers. And EJB was really popular. I know early EJB was kind of slow, but there's uh, lighter versions of that around now. And people started using various web services, for example, SOAP. And then people used like JMS messaging to talk to, you know, just straight JMS Java or MQ series or MQ, whatever. Eventually, they developed REST services that are basically easier to set up. P uh, people used uh, enterprise service buses. Now there's a lot of um, RPC servers. There's probably about a dozen of them out there. I don't know if anybody uses ACA or any of the other servers out there. 
Now, Finagle was written in Scala, but you can talk to it with any language that you can use on the JVM. You can, you can code in Java, you can code in Scala, JRuby, Groovy, any of those kind of languages. Uh, the other ones like ACA, some of them are written in Java. Basically, Fagle, Finagle provides uh, service instances via clients. We'll show you how to create a client. They expose the service instance via servers. And it adds behavior, so you can add behavior at when you, you know, compile the code, you can configure it that way, or you can programmatically, at runtime, add behavior to that. We'll talk about some of the, run, the way you do it uh, in the code. Um, it'll, you know, have retrying, connection pooling, load balancing, rate limiting, so you can uh, specify how many times you want to retry a particular server and maybe give it a time limit before you mount, uh, mark that server as being dead and stop using that server. That, that's completely configurable. Um, the connection pooling is, is configurable too. Uh, like I said, load balancing, they try to divide the request up so that the server that's got the least number of active requests that haven't returned a response, that would be the server that uh, Finagle would use for the next uh, request. That, that's, it's called a future. Um, it provides monitoring and stats. So basically, if you've got distributed systems running on like eight different servers, you can collect all the, the stats and logging and monitoring all in one place. So if you want to go generate some nice reports to see the various usages of the various servers, you can generate nice reports in one place. You can log all the servers and clients all into one place too. Keep the statistics so you don't have to go, when you're trying to trace a problem, you don't have to go log on to five different servers to figure out where the issue is. Uh, Finagle provides a number of uh, codices to implement uh, wire protocols. Uh, they provide a no number of them. Uh, we'll talk about some of those. And you can actually, you know, create some of your own if you want to. We'll, we'll go through an example of that. It also manages resources for you. Okay. Most of uh, Finagle is protocol agnostic. Okay. So you can use Codex for Thrift, which is um, an Apache project that basically... Uh, it's an RPC project that can basically talk to any kind of uh, program, whether it be uh, C or Java or .NET or, you know, what, whatever kind of a program it is. It, it basically uses a simple interface uh, to talk to another server. We, we'll uh, show some examples of Thrift. It can use just regular uh, HTTP. Now, both um, Thrift and HTTP are basically, uh, you know, single RPC. You get one request, generates one response. Okay, it's a one-to-one -one thing. Um, it also supports Kestrel, Redis, and streaming HTTP, and generic multiplexing. So uh, you can have requests that one HTTP call would generate multiple responses, and it'll, uh, you can set that up. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, so basically the styles, you've got re re request response, streaming, or multiplexing. Uh, writing a new codec is easy. You can write your own if you don't like uh, what they provide. Um, it's built on top of Netty for the event loop. Uh, Netty is basically uh, handling the um, connections, and that's built on top of NIO, Java NIO. Uh, it provides Scala and Java parity. So as I mentioned, you can write in Java, you can write in Scala, you can write in JRuby, Groovy, whatever. It, Scala is a little bit better because there's less lines of code and you have basically lightweight closures you can use, but Java works fine. A lot of people, even at Twitter, they code in Java too. It provides a robust implementation of connection pools with throttling to avoid TCP connection churn. It's got failure detectors to identify slower crashed hosts. So there's um, failover strategies. So if a host isn't responding, it'll kind of ignore that host and send the traffic to the healthy host. As I mentioned, there's load balancing. So the server that has the least uh, uh, re request that it hasn't responded to, that's going to be the next one that's going to hit. Um, there's back pressure techniques. So if you got a denial of service attack or someone's trying to bring down your server, it'll it can kind of detect that and defend the servers. And it makes it easy to deploy services where you, you know, like I said, publish standard statistics, logs, and exception reports. So you can generate all that in one place. You can have nice reports. There's a really nice reporting tool built into it. Um, you can do distributed tracing using Dapper across the different, different protocols. So you can trace, um, you know, all the different uh, calls across the different uh, servers. 
if you want to use Zookeeper for cluster management, you can configure your uh, all your servers and all your services in, in uh, Zookeeper, so that can all be done you know dynamically using a console. Um, and it supports common charting strategies. So if you have a lot of uh, distributed databases, things like that, you can you can set that up. As I said, it's protocol agnostic. Uh, the main protocols it supports out of the box are HTTP, uh, streaming HTTP using Comet, where you have a long-lived connection where you're waiting for multiple responses. Um, Thrift, Apache Thrift will show examples of that. Uh, Memcache Kestrel, that Kestrel is something that uh, Twitter developed on their own. Um, MySQL, of course, and then there's many more to come. They probably already provided some already, but... You use, um, it provides builders. So you have a client builder uh, that builds a, a service implementation of a client. So you can see in this example, now this is Scala, but we'll go through some Java examples if you don't know Scala. Basically, this one um, returns a client they're basically giving it a name of, you know, HTTP load test, giving it the codec. You can uh, specify the host. This is just using a string, but in reality, you'd probably go out and try to locate the host yourself because um, you're, you know, running and we got prod servers and dev servers and QA servers. Um, and then you probably wouldn't hard code it. And then you, it just basically builds it, returns the client to you. The service builder to build the service is just, just as e easy. It basically... E Pass all the same information, but in this case, you have a socket address that uh, what it's going to send. Like this, in this case, it in Scala, eighty eighty is going to default to the local host, and it basically it's you know using HTTP and building it. At the end, of course, you want to close your server when you're done with it. Okay, here's um, an example of a simple HTTP server. The first example is in Scala, and you, you can see the code's not that different in Java. So basically. You uh, create a server, you create a socket address or whatever uh, kind of address you want to create, and then basically you assign that uh, service and that address to the server, um, you know, give it a name, do a build on it. The job is very similar. Um, basically, it's uh, using a local host uh, 10,000, as example. Um, the client. Um, the code's pretty easy also. You just basically create the client. Um, you create the, you know, HTTP request. In this case, it's just doing an HTTP get, and then it generates a future response. Now, a future is one of the basic building blocks of Twitter, and this is a Twitter future, not a Java future, and basically a Twitter is a promise to return a response in the future, but it may or may not happen. So you're asking for some kind of a response, now, you know, it could time out, it could fail, but it's, it's, it's kind of like a list where you're asking for things. You can have a single response or you can add a, a sequence of responses, and we'll go into those various combinations later on. Um, it's the Java implementation of the same thing. You can set a, a connection limit on the uh, client. So basically, this, in this case, it would be five connections concurrently. As I mentioned, it extends uh, Netty model, so basically that's an asynchronous RPC uh, server, and then it, it uses NIO. But this provides a lot of services that you wouldn't get out of, you know, just out of Netty itself. Just a lot of handling of events for you. Basically, these finagle objects are the building blocks you use for finagle. These are the m most common you're going to see. Like I said, everything is basically a future. A future object is a promise of a, a future. Event. It's an asynchronous operation unless you put it in a sequential combinator. We'll talk about those. Um, the service object performs the work, so that's basically the call. What do you want to do? What, what kind of a call do you want to do? The filter object, uh, that's where you're going to spend most of your time in Finagle. It basically lets you transform uh, the response or the request and... Um, also, it can provide handlers for different uh, exceptions or events within the call. The filter can be added on the client or on the server. You can add it uh, any place you want to add it. We'll, go, we'll have some examples of how to create those. And, of course, the codec, as I mentioned, that's the protocol. They provide a number of them, but you can create your own, and that's basically it's encoding the way the message is handling, handled by the server. Okay, as I mentioned, future objects are there. It's basically an asynchronous computation that is uh, 
you, you, you set it up and basically the two basic kinds, you have a block and uh, weight. A block and weight is, let's say you're reading from the disk or you're doing a long computation or you're maybe reading a remote system that might be takes a while to respond. So you, you, you know that this thing isn't going to uh, return right away, so you want to give it some time and let other processes run while this thing is running. Um, the other way is just to register the callback, where it, whenever it succeeds or fails, it returns the result to the client. Um, rather than passing the callback to a dispatch routine, the dispatch routine returns a future, which is a promise. So basically, you add the callback into the future before you pass it to the, uh, the server. It's, it's, not, it's kind of backwards from the way you traditionally do things. So here's an example of some um, simple futures. I know this code isn't Scala, but we'll have Java examples too. The first one just creates a simple future. It takes a string. Um, the second one, you can do a get, but in this example, you probably never do this because it, it's going to wait indefinitely. The third example is you, basically you're going to wait one second. It's going to return. Now, you don't know... After one second, you don't know if the thing is actually timed out, if it's got an error, or what's going on. It's just going to return whatever happened after one second. So you actually need some more code to make this really functional. And the next request, we basically uh, create a block. So that's a blocked event, like we said. You do a HTTP GET request, and then basically um, do the request on the client, and basically that, that'll block until the result is returned. Again, there's no error handling in this example. Um, the next one um, basically is, is when you schedule a job. Now, in this case, you, what, the future is not available until the scheduled job completes. Okay, so it's another way to do it. There is something called a promise. A promise is basically, it extends the future, but a promise actually lets you write and not just um, not just read. So a regular future, you can just, just read. A promise, you can read and write. In general, you, you create a promise, you cast it to a future, and then, the, um, you, then you send it to the consumer of that um, event. So basically, you, you basically, the server doesn't really see the, the promise. He just sees that he's got a future and acts on it, and then when it comes back, the client, if he has to write something to it or change it, he can change it. Um, you can do futures with timeouts. So basically, here I'm creating an HTTP request and then telling the cli client uh, to go ahead and get the request. And then I'm saying, okay, in one second, whatever happened, I, I want to get that back. So it's going to print out the result in one second. Now, it may have finished. It may have still be waiting and, you know, timed out, or it may have failed. Okay, you had a question? Um, this is Twitter finagle, yeah. A promise is, extends the actual future. A future, every request is a future, but a promise is a special type of future. But it's, it's not a Java future, it's a, it's a Twitter, Twitter, okay. It's, it's, it's different. Yes, a promise is just like a future. The server treats it the same. Okay, it's going to return an event. So if you, if you fire off a thousand promises and don't, don't put them in any combinator. They would just, they'd be asynchronous. Each one would execute, and then whenever they're done or fail or whatever, you get the result. Okay, we'll, we'll go through some combinations of how you can combine these to make it really powerful. Here's an example of a timeout filter. As I mentioned, a, t a filter can transform the request or the response, but it can also uh, handle events. In this case, they have something called a timeout filter. I can you notice there's no protocol in there, so I can add this filter to any. Um, I can add it, you know, to any future request. I can add this timeout. So basically, I set the the time limit, and then basically, you know, pass it the future and the time limit and whatever. And I I can reuse this, right? So because it doesn't matter what protocol, I can use this for you know all different types of um, you know futures. I can give it different uh, timeout limits, whatever. So it's a pretty pretty nice thing to use. Um, I said because the filter can be put on the client or on the server so whichever one decides that you know he needs to um, have a timeout because it you know servers can have different timeout times some of them you expect a re response in a second or two some of them two minutes is you know not bad so so
Can you do what? Can I, for the, in this car, can I call Matt on that? Say, take a future of an integer, then say times three, and it will be executed whenever the value is available, and I'll get the result back. Well, it, it, well, we'll show, we'll show that. You probably want to, we'll get to some examples, but you probably want to do like on success or on failure or wait for those events to happen before you start accessing it. I mean, you can try to read it, but you won't know if you just read it without checking to see if it's done yet. You know what I mean? But yeah, you can access it once you get it back. See? But you probably want to put some more code than that. Just try to, you know what I mean? Uh, we'll go through some examples. Okay. Um, you know what I'm saying? You probably want to add some more code because if you, if you, you just create the future and then, you know, pass it to the service and then just try to read it. It might not be done yet, okay? But anyway. So here's an example of using error handling. So in this case, uh, I create a promise and then I, I call it and I, I, you know, I trap the error, I trap if it was canceled and then execute the promise. So you can, you can throw exceptions the same way you would do on a, any kind of a call. And then the, the exception can be handled in the, you know, the proper place on the proper server. As I mentioned, a codec encodes and decodes wire protocols such as HTTP. Basically, th these are the ones they provide, Thrift, HTTP, Mencaf, Kestrel, HTTP, chunk streaming, using Twitter, whatever, but you can write your own. Here's an example of creating your own codec. So here's creating a, a codec called string codec. Basically, it handles like uh, end of lines and stuff like that. Um, Here's the rest of it. Basically, you create that, and once you create that codec, you can you can create a client using that codec, and you create a server using that codec, and then they can talk to each other. Okay. Um, it, as we were talking before, uh, as you asked your question, there, see here's some example of some simple callbacks. So I create this future, and I say, well, on success, I want I want that condition trapped, and I'm going to return it on success, or, or I'm going to. Um, if it's on a failure, whether it's based on a timeout or whether it's based on an exception, I can um, print the stack tracer, see what went on. B basically, you want to try to handle it using callbacks. A callback is, is passed in with the future. So that, okay. Uh, there's, as I mentioned, there's filter objects. We went through an example of a timeout filter, but basically uh, you can use these to um, handle exceptions as we, we showed with the timeout, uh, authorization problems. Uh, you can transform the, either the request or the response to something different. It basically wraps the service and converts the input and output types or does error handling or whatever you want it to do. And that, that's where most of your code is going to be is writing these filters. Here's a simple example of creating a filter. So this is an authorization filter. So when the person tries to authorize their account, they enter the secret question. If they get the answer right, it, uh, fine. But if they, don't get, it, if they don't get the answer right, they, it throws an exception. Um, here's an example of using the filter to transform the request and the responses. So this is um, basically, it's returning results. If, the, if it's correct, it returns an okay, otherwise, it returns errors if the authentication fails. You can see that. It basically, it tries to look at the session and the authorization. Basically, a single sign-on type thing. Okay. Now, like I said, you can just fire off a bunch of futures, and they'll all execute asynchronously. But if you want to make this really powerful, there's different combinators, and you can do a sequential composition, or, or you can do uh, asynchronous composition. So for sequential composition, the most important combinator is a flat map. And when you have a flat map, that means you're gonna execute um, futures one at a time, and it'll wait till it gets the result, you know, the, re the response from one request before it executes the next request and so on. So for example, if you go to Twitter and you try to log in, it'll try to authorize your account if that fails, it, it doesn't go in and try to get the user and try to get all your tweets, right? But if, it, if that succeeds, then it executes, um, the, it goes and gets the user, and then it, it uses another kind of combinator to, to go get all your tweets from all the different servers and then combine them into one uh, future and then return all those tweets. But, so 
now the flat map, if one, if one event fails, like I said, the, the uh, one future fails, they all fail. So you don't have to worry about where to handle that. The, the, it's either all or nothing. There are some sequential ones that Twitter provides that will handle failures and maybe do something different on a failure. But that's, we're not going to show that today. Okay, but there's also concurrent composition. So basically the three most common ones are collect, join, and select. And this is basically where you want to execute um, a group of um, futures all at the same time. So let's say you're doing a search and you want to search like different servers, different databases, whatever, and combine all the results together when you get done. So you can take all of these um, futures, combine them into one of these, um, these combinators, and then it'll go ahead and return the results. It kind of turns a... Um, sequence of future into what they call a future of sequences. So you think of a future as a list, okay? It can be one thing or it can be a list of things, right? So here's, okay, so a collect is the most straightforward one, okay? And a collect, basically, if you have futures, they're all the same type, okay? You can basically uh, assign these things to a collect, execute them, and then when they've all completed or when one of them has failed, whatever, it'll go ahead and collect them all in one future and return that future, which is basically a, a future of sequences. It's, it has all of them. So. Uh, unless, unless you handle it, it's going to stop when the first one fails. But you can handle certain events if you want to handle it. Okay. All of them are completed or you have a failure. Either one. Like I said, you can if you want to handle a failure and you know do something with it, you can handle it. So, okay, a join is basically the same thing, but when you're doing a join, they can be mixed types. They don't have to be the same type of um, future. You can have futures that are you know different signatures, different return types, whatever. So, you know, it, it's basically the same thing. And then a select. Um, a select returns a future when the first of the given futures completes, okay, together with the remaining uncompleted futures. So basically this is like when the first one completes, like I want to try five different things and whatever the first one's done, that, that's what I'm going to return to the user. So, I'm, you know, maybe you can try different methods. You don't know, you know, what kind of user this is or whatever. You can try different databases, whatever, until you find the person and then return that. But what really makes this powerful is you can combine these things. So you can take a flat map and you can execute, say, your authorization, and that's what they do on Twitter. And then you can go ahead and get the user, and then you can do a um, uh, one of the concurrent um, events to go out and get all the tweets from different servers, different MySQL servers, whatever. You can combine those all, so that would be like the third step. But the authorization fails, you never get to that. So you combine these uh, various uh, concurrent uh, combinators into a flat map, and then, like I said, you can stop it wherever, wherever you want to, but it basically, uh, it's very powerful. They, there's an example um, on the web, I'll provide the address later, but it's uh, called SearchBird, where they created a, a search engine with 200 lines of code, and I know you would want more code in a, in a real server, but basically it uses fan-out indexes, where they go ahead and create all these indexes and fan them out, do all these searches, and then combine the results and fan them back in again, and this basically has all of the different, uh, you know, structures you would use in a real uh, search um, engine to really, uh, you know, go out and combine all those results. And there's, as I mentioned, there's fail over detection in clusters. So there's an abstraction called clusters where you can register the clients and servers. So you probably want to, you know, maybe dynamically, unless you're using a zookeeper or something to configure this, you probably want to dynamically have your servers register themselves or, or register um, various um, services. And then, the, of course, the failure detection will mark the host is dead. So if you can set the time limit if you want and uh, the number of retries you want to try on that server, so you can say if this thing doesn't respond in two minutes more than three times or something like that, you can say I want to go ahead and just mark that as dead. And there's also a directory where you can do dynamic registration on the server side and dynamic discovery on the client side. So that's where I'm saying you're registering these the various servers and services. So you don't have to hard code it, which you probably don't want to do. 
and then basically you can you can call this an AJAC. Basically, this is like a jQuery example. You need more code. Basically, you get a web page. Maybe you're going to go out there and look for some user information. If it doesn't return, you know you don't really care. But um, basically, you're going to call uh, Twitter. Hey, here's some um, URLs. Basically, uh, you can download all this code from GitHub, or you know, basically there's. Um, you can download the project, there's sample projects, you can download like, all the Scala docs, there's a finagler group and, and Google groups. As I mentioned, this, this um, search bird here, you can just do a web search for search bird uh, finagle and get that. It's basically a search engine with 200 lines of code. You wouldn't really run this, but like I said, it provides all of the different um, you know, fan out indexes and the various indexes you would use to basically uh, you know, execute a thousand requests at once for every search word and then combine all the results together when you get done. I'm going to show um, here. Okay, we set up an example here. We set up an example in NetBeans of just some basic, uh, uh, simple code here. Now, this doesn't use any of the combinators we've talked about, but it's, so it's just firing these things off asynchronously. Okay, so right here, first thing I do is I basically create the client um, using the client builder. So this is setting a, a socket address of 8080. This is using the Thrift client we talked about, the Apache Thrift, which basically is a language independent uh, RPC server. And basically it sets a connection limit of 80. So there can be 80 connections open at once. And then it assigns that cl um, client to a service interface. That's a, the service interface for the Thrift. Okay. So I have a method here called hi, and this method will be called once, and basically it just returns the name or it throws a failure back. So if it's on, um, on failure, of course, it um, logs the cause. If it's successful, it logs the value return. The next example, I'm just adding two numbers together. So uh, these First two examples are non-blocking calls. They're just you know fast calls. They go and you know get it, get the guy's name or add two numbers together and they come back. So uh, this one either returns the result of the calculation or returns the error. Okay, this next example is going to execute a thousand calls, but basically it's going to call this thing a thousand times to do the addition of these random numbers. So this is a blocking call. Um, since this is on the same uh, machine, it would really execute quickly, but we put a delayed loop in here to kind of slow it down to make it seem like it. And the delay is random, so it can be anywhere from one to 10 second delay. So as we fire these things off, they're gonna come back in different orders depending on the delay. Okay, so it's just basically simulating something you might do in you know, real life where you got a slow response from your server, or you're doing a, a read of the disk, or a complicated calculation, or, or something like that, or database query that takes a while. And then it basically, it, it calls them um, a thousand times and then it, it goes through and checks to see if, if they're all done right here in the loop. So right here it calls the thing and checks to see if they're all done, if the, if the count is equal. If, the, if they're not done, it just goes to sleep for a second and goes out and looks again, see if they're done. Then it releases the client, obviously. And then it logs, you know, the results. So, so here's just a simple um, server example. Okay, the server example, basically, you know, you create a new server, you, uh, you know, you build the server, you know, set the socket address. This is a thrift again. You, you give it the name of the server, and then. Um, this is the service interface where it creates the, the pool, the service pool. And it, it's got a random uh, routine here, you see. We'll sh show where that's used. And then basically, the first method, as I said, it's just a simple method. It's not blocked. It just adds two numbers together. And then the second method down here, this is the, uh, the actual blocking call method. So basically, it, it it calculates the random delay. 
So basically, you know, the first one might be delayed for three seconds, my next one might be 10, next one might be five, so they're all gonna finish at different times. And then it uh, simulates the delay. This is the one where, like I said, there's a little timing loop just to burn some CPU. Then it applies that, the blocking. And then this last method, that's the high method, where it just returns the name, okay? So, if we, okay, so if you run this, run the client, okay. You see they're all failing now because I didn't start the server, right? So just to show you it will handle the failures, fine. So, so I need to, let me see, let me stop that. I'll stop that. Start it up the right way now. Okay, this time I'm this time I'm gonna start the server. Okay, the server started. The thrift server. I'm gonna start the client. Okay, now this console it's you got one uh, console for the client and one for the server, so it's kind of hard to see how the results are going in. I'll, I'll show you how they're all logged together, though. So, Okay, so here, here's the results, okay, so basically the thrift server is running. Basically, it, now it's receiving requests. The first request was the high, the second request was the add, and you'll only see one uh, response for the high and one for the add. Now, for these other requests, um, basically it's, it's adding the numbers and you can see the first one blocks it for nine seconds and some of them block for one second or two seconds or whatever, so they're coming back in all different orders. And if you go all the way down, it's it'll it's going to call this thing a, a thousand times, and then eventually, when the counts a thousand, it's going to stop. So it's really really pretty quick, and it does a lot for you. So, does anybody have any questions or? Pardon? Discovery, but if you, if you use Discovery, you can register those. You can either use Zookeeper. Oh, I'm sorry. You can either use Zookeeper, or you can uh, dynamically each of the servers can register the services. You know, when they boot up or whatever, they can register the service and what server they are, and then it can go out and find well, which servers will you know handle this type of service request, right? Because like it's in production and dev, you know, you're gonna have different names of the servers and all that, so you're probably not gonna want to hard code it like in the examples. But you can use, like I said, either Zookeeper to configure them or you can uh, dynamically uh, register the servers in the directory and, and the services in the directory. So, because you could have multiple um, finagle servers going on for different things. So, but, yeah. Do 
Oh yeah, I can just talk to an HTTP server, right? HTTPS, uh, yeah, it works fine. Yeah. Oh, before Finagle, we really just, you know, <laughs> didn't really use anything, you know. I mean, it, you just call different services and wait, you know what I mean? And you'd have, things got slower and slower, you know. I mean, so, no, we didn't use anything else before that. Nothing like this. We, you know, used some soap calls and we used some rest calls and we use some, you know, whatever, I mean, so. Any other questions? They just keep adding more requirements every time they make a call, either for e-commerce or to save projects and stuff. There's just more and more stuff they want us to do every time, you know. They, it's like, oh, well, we want to, you know, send emails to this guy. Oh, we want this guy in our, um, you know, sales force. We want this guy in ERP. We want, you know, they want to constantly get a list of customers and be able to contact the customers and do, they're, you know, really into the marketing, you know, end of it. And so there's a lot of updates going on, but we didn't want the people on the website to have to wait for all these events to happen. I mean, it's really... Okay, what if, what if you're waiting for a call or what if it fails? What, you know, what's the user going to do about it, you know? I mean, does she kind of hate to go to a website and have to wait for two minutes or have it throw an error at you that really nothing you can do about, right? So, so the guy in the back, does he have a question? So, so you going to buy me a beer? <laughs> so Craig's buying everybody beer. He's in the back row. So. so there's a, what's that? If you go online and print this out, there's, if everybody didn't, there's this JCB party in about 10 minutes. It's over on Ellis Street. Yeah. It's, um, there's this place. JCB Community Park Party. It's pretty good. They give prizes out too. Thank you, Brian. We just had all different kinds of web apps, right? Oh, we had a, uh, you had a client and all of a sudden the functional like inspector coming in with, we want to do this, we want to do that. Right. We yeah, every so call they went more and, and more and more. And then whenever you SAP or ERP, I had some way to talk to them and then you, you use that first and then you sort of like a, put blocks onto your uh, web application. Yeah, I mean. Some you realize. Well, like I say, I'm in the kiosk and I just want to send an email to a guy. I don't want to wait for all this stuff to happen. I just want, okay, fine, your email's sent. And then this stuff, he, it's, not the, it's, not the, it's not his problem. Yeah, they just, want, they just want more and more stuff. When, you know, when somebody logs on, you don't want to wait like for two minutes to log on just because it's going out there and updating all these tables and doing all this stuff and getting all your project information and all that, you know what I mean? Oh, no, we just found this on the web, you know, stuff. So tried it out. But yeah, but you know, marketing keeps adding more and more stuff, and they're always, like I said, they want to use all these remote uh, software service things like Salesforce and uh, C, uh, CRM, customer relationship management systems, and SAP. They have, they have two or three of them going at one time, you know what I mean? All these services they want to update to keep all this customer information. So. There's a lot of them out. You know, if you want to check out, there's a lot. AKA is pretty similar. Uh, there's a lot of other ones. There's about 10 of them out there. I think you can find all this on it's the web. It's getting more and more popular. Yeah, there's a lot of them out there. They're, they're getting more popular. But Well, I mean, look, I mean, you look at Twitter. It's a pretty high-volume website. I mean, you know, if they're using it, it's got to, you know, they do a lot more volume than we do. I can tell you that. You know what I mean? But um, there's other ones out there. You might try AKKA, which is more of a Java, you know. So logically, how is it different than like JMS? Um, it just it just provides, like I said, a lot more um, you know event handling and. Uh, you know, groups, you know. I haven't used that, but you know I'm just regular JMS. It's just like a single request, right? I mean, but this will 
kind of group them in different ways or group the results in different ways or do error handling or do, you know, like statistics and stuff. It'll do a lot more of that kind of stuff for yeah, you. Yeah, other advantage is uh, to use a JMS uh, asynchronously. You need some kind of uh, you know, enterprise service first and those things. But yeah. you don't need this thing. Yeah, this does a lot of that load balancing, all that kind of stuff for you. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? It does a lot of stuff. Well, I just wondered logically, like, you know, trying to well, put a handle on yeah, it's just if you're just doing single calls and you're not doing a lot of different type of calls, you know, like mixed calls, that would probably be fine. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. It was in the same position. Oh. They were waiting. Also. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You might have just answered this because I think it's something similar. So, Enable is basically um, a service handler for asynchronous Right. Calls, it just right? takes into advance, fires them so, off at the same time. So like I said, the, the, yeah. so the, the client, like I said, maybe they don't ever finish, I mean, whatever, but the client doesn't care if you want to, you know, fire off. Uh, okay. So what, what additional advantages have you seen with this as opposed to just using like JMS or something? Where you can still fire things asynchronously with the well, this way you can group them in different ways. You can do reporting. So it's kind of like you can do reporting. You can it's kind of like, like you can do load load balancing. It just provides a lot of stuff on top of that. I know what you're saying, but yeah, it it provides a lot of different services. You can like I said, do reporting. You can you can log all into one place from all these different servers. You can you know it's just kind of a framework that gives you a lot of services you wouldn't have otherwise. And, you know, different kinds of those same things on top of JMS, but this is oh yeah, sure you could have. But, you know, okay. and some, it provides different protocols too. Where JMS, you need yeah, to. Yeah, that's a good point. Where JMS, you know, you okay, one box but might yeah, be one you might be running MQ on this box and MQ series on this and some. You know, what I mean, there's different implementations of JMS for that matter, right? You know what I'm saying? But if you're just doing like uh, HTTP calls or trip calls or whatever, you don't have to have all that set up on every machine. You know what I mean? So, Got it. Thank you. But, okay.